Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming the multi-talented filmmaker, John Callis. He uh, dir directed the 1988 horror cult classic Lone Wolf, the heavy metal werewolf movie. But uh, he was also a crew member on Raging Bull and um, The Happy Hooker Goes to Hollywood, The Hills Have Eyes Part 2. He's had an amazing career. He's cut trailers for so many movies, uh, from A Few Good Men to The Golden Child to Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Uh, he was a producer on Howie Bandel's cartoon Bob Bobby's World. He produced some of my favorite music videos. Um, Glenn Fry's Smuggler's Blues, Sammy Hagar's I Can't Drive 55, so many. And he's coming on the show today. We're going to talk about all that stuff. And it's going to be pretty good. Pretty good. And I hope you all had a happy Valentine's Day. I had a Valentine. Um, she was a guest on my show, but I won't say who. Because it's not a long-term committed relationship. But thank you so much, my mystery celebrity guest. So, uh, yeah, here is my interview with John Callis. Good morning, John. Welcome to the show, sir. How are you today? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Pretty good. This is uh, such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Uh, it's my pleasure. I'm uh, excited to be here with you. Awesome. Awesome. So, going back in time, did you gravitate toward film early on in your childhood? Um, I, well, I was very fascinated with film when I first saw Pinocchio. I wanted to know how his nose grew. <laughs> it was it was kind of an interesting introduction to film, but um, it wasn't until I got later on into college that I made a transition uh, because I started out college as a chemistry major, and my teacher took me for a walk and said, "Look, you're you're an A student in chemistry. You're really bright at it. You're doing labs in 45 minutes, where other students take three hours, but you're not a chemist." And he asked me why I wanted to be a chemist. And I told him that my dad had died when I was three and I wanted to cure cancer. He mm -hmm. put his arm around and he said, you know, that's very admirable, but um, you're not a chemist. You're out of my class. I said, what? He goes, you're an artist. You've got to go find yourself. So I went and I sat on the, uh, the quad in my college campus and an uh, African-American friend of mine, Liz, came by and said, what are you doing? I told mm -hmm. her I got thrown out of chemistry and she said, you straight A student. We went through the whole scenario. Mm -hmm. And she convinced me to go and just help her read some lines at a theater play that they were rehearsing. Well, about halfway through the hour, I decided I needed to go do my homework, and the director said, you can't leave, you're in a rehearsal. I said, what do you mean a rehearsal? I just came to help Liz, and he said, no, no, you, you're the lead in this play. So it just kind of felt right. I liked the people, and I gave it a shot. The next thing I knew, it was in my blood, and... I went off and got a master's degree at Occidental College in theater arts and transitioned into film. Wow, that is pretty amazing and pretty honorable that you wanted to cure cancer because of your father's death. Um, are you active in um, cancer research these days? I am not because, um, honestly, since his death, I, I realized that the industry in itself is so bent on... Um, making money instead of curing cancer because it, look yeah. if we can cure the pandemic uh in such a short time and we can cure all these other diseases we can go to the moon they can certainly cure cancer they you know there there have been strides i will admit you know immunotherapy is very good stuff and mm -hmm. uh, i admire all the efforts being made but it seems to me they're just dragging the anchor because there's so many billions of dollars at stake yeah. so i'm a little disheartened by the whole idea of it Oh, I hear you. Yeah, it's terrible. Did you have any uh, directorial influences? Absolutely. Um, Lena Wurtzmiller, I thought, was amazing. Um, I mean, all of the greats were, you know, I uh, it goes to John Huston, Mark Donovich. Uh, God, they just go on and on and on. Uh, you got Alfred Hitchcock, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some of the greats. Uh, the Scorsese, of course, Spielberg, I love. 
Yeah. Um, Robert Redford has a good eye. You know, and it goes on from there. I, I try to learn from every director by looking at his work and saying, would I have done that differently, or how did he do that, or that was really clever, or wow. I'm not even thinking about all the technical aspects. I just found myself enjoying the film. That's when I know it's a good film. Right. Wow. So, where are you from originally? Originally, I'm from New Jersey. You're from New Jersey. Uh, what, what, uh, what year did you move to L.A.? Uh, well, it, it was a long path. I started in New Jersey, then I went to uh, Virginia. I was put on a train at 12 years old because they thought I had a discipline problem. <laughs> um, they put me on a train alone from New York City to Virginia, where I went to school in, in Virginia at a military academy to try to straighten me out. Uh, when that failed, <laughs> uh, they sent me to a private school in Massachusetts, and then from Massachusetts I went to Colorado, and then from Colorado I came to California, and that was in uh, 1973. Wow. And you were a, a dialogue uh, director on a movie called Young Lady Chatterley. I was. It was, uh, it was an interesting twist because I was really just part of the, um, the film crew. And during a lunch, I had mentioned to a guy sitting next to me that the film was running behind because the actors were not sticking with their uh, accent that they needed. And I, I, I said, I would bet money they were in a Sean Connery play. So the guy turns and he goes, hey, um, he turned to the actor. He says, you've been in a play lately? He goes, yeah, Sean Connery, why? And so he stands up and he says, uh, what's your name? I said, John Callis. And I turned to the other guy and said, who is this guy? Because it's the director. I wanted to climb under the table. <laughs> and so he announced me as the dialogue director, and from there I worked with the actors to make sure their accents were proper. And uh, the film got back on track, and uh, he thanked me and then took me in as his assistant director on his next film. Nice. Yeah, was that a good experience overall? Is that where you learned, you know, the, the ropes of, um, of being on set? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I was very grateful for the opportunity, and, and I ran with it. How did you get to work on Martin Scorsese's iconic Raging Bull? Well, a friend of mine introduced me to the um, production coordinator and, and then, of course, UPM, and um, they were looking for a production assistant help. And, uh, you know, so I put my name forward, and because uh, my friend knew the UPM and coordinator, um, they gave me a shot at it, and that was pretty damn exciting. Yeah, that, that, that's got to be one of the absolute highlights of your career. Well, it was, and it was probably the only most embarrassing moment I've ever had in my entire life. And I'll, <laughs> I'll share it with your audience and you, because <laughs> it, 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 to me, I always laugh when I think about it. But um, I've worked with some top, top A-list actors, and I've always looked at them as human beings, not some godlike figure that people seem to want to assign deities to. Right. Um, and, and I've just never been one who was snobby, like, oh, my God, I met this billion... I can have a beer with a bum or a billionaire. I'm going to treat you the same because I look at you as a human being. Right. But having said that, Martin Scorsese had, had uh, he was working with Robert De Niro, uh, and, and the combination was phenomenal to watch because it was just like something out of space. It was just poetry in motion. Mm -hmm. One day, the UPM said I needed to run over to the um, boxing ring and give Robert De Niro an envelope. Uh, mm -hmm. And I said, okay. So I grabbed the envelope, I ran over, and he was in the ring practicing, you know, rehearsing his punching. And I waved the envelope, and he waved his boxing glove, meaning just hold on, he's finishing up. He came out of the ring, he takes his glove off, he sticks his hand out, he goes, Hi, what's your name? And there I am shaking hands with Robert De Niro, and I look at him, I go, Robert De Niro. And he smiled, and he goes, No, 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 that's my name, what's your name? Yeah. And <laughs> I just, there's an envelope, I gotta go, and he goes, Don't you want a response? I said, Oh, okay, and I'm standing there, like, just about ready to piss my pants with embarrassment. And he was very gracious. He was a gentleman. He smiled and he said, yeah, tell him I'll be over later. I said, oh, okay, thanks. And I ran out of there so fast. And I sat on the curb. I wanted to throw up. I was so embarrassed. Yeah. <laughs> Man. Did, did, so did you know it was going to be a special movie? Watching it, I had every suspicion it was going to be special. I mean, I, I watched one shot that I will never forget as long as I'm alive. They started um, with Robert De Niro in a dressing room in the basement of the um, boxing arena that we were in. Mm -hmm. Now, this is all in one take. They followed him out of the dressing room, down through the entire crowd of thousands, up a set of stairs where the ropes in the boxing ring were on like a hinge kind of thing where they had him flat. And as soon as he stepped over them, the ropes came up so you could see the camera coming through the ropes almost. He steps on a, on a platform and the, the crane 
arm went up in the air as De Niro enters the ring, all in one take. Now, unfortunately, they didn't use that in the show, but to watch that and rehearse it and see how it was done, I would think, holy Jesus, that's something to put in your mind to remember how to do something like that. So if you get to be a director, you'll have that in your bag of tricks. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's so cool. Then you worked on The Happy Hooker Goes Hollywood. Oh, yeah, another famous film. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. It was uh, an interesting... That's actually one of the places I started to cut my teeth um, in the art department, and then eventually the director, uh, Lightman, we, I became part of his crew for a while and became his uh, AD assistant director. Yeah, that was a good experience? Very good experience. I was working on uh, Wes Craven's The Hills Have Lies Part 2. Pretty amazing, I have to say. Um, uh, when I was hired to do it, um, the owner of the company said, go over and talk to Wes at his house. You know, He's going to want to know who you are and how you work and blah, blah, blah. So I went over, I sat down, he introduced himself. We sat down, and he, I, I tell you, uh, unlike so many directors, he wanted me to know what was inside his head. Mm -hmm. He didn't hide the shot list, and we went through every single scene over days and he would explain exactly what he wanted to do with the camera uh, how he wanted to frame it up and what shots he wanted to do in what order so that i as, as an assistant could keep makeup and wardrobe ahead keep all of the departments informed and the show went really really well uh with with all that information available so that that singly was a great experience and watching Wes work as a director again found a lot of little bags of tricks that i stuck in my pocket and walked away Every director I've ever uh, worked with, whether it was on a, uh, a film set, TV show, cable, uh, what else, um, commercials, and et cetera, I tried to learn one trick that they were doing, not trick as much as technique, um, that someday I could put in and find my voice and figure out who I was as a director and how I wanted to work with actors and all that kind of good stuff. Yeah, yeah. I've heard um, it was a bad experience for the the actors that were involved in in that, and it wasn't as as good as the first and stuff. But that's good that you had a good experience on that. Well, you know, it's kind of a subjective thing. I think actors, um, yeah, it depends on what the actor comes in with and what they want to get out of it and how they're functioning and the script and all that. I mean, look, you can make the argument: was it better than the first? Was it better than you know? The, yeah. The was better than the first. You know, it, it's really up to the audience to decide that. And I, I'm sorry to hear that, and I never heard that from many actors that they didn't have a good experience, but uh, I'll take your word for it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, during the time that um, you're working on movie sets, you're also um, involved in music videos and concert films. How did that come about? Boy, that's a good question. Um, when I was doing a bunch of uh, commercials and things, a, a friend of mine said, Hey, uh, you interested in doing any music videos? I said, yeah, sure. And so I got introduced to Kramer Rockland and a couple of other companies that were doing music videos. And at the time, they were um, just starting out. So I got to work with some really great artists and, um, uh, and had, I just had a ball doing it. And that, that just led to tons of work for me because at some point I started getting the reputation of uh, if you can't figure out how to do something, call Callis, he'll figure it out for you. So that, that became uh, kind of my calling card in a sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of my favorite music videos of all time is Glenn Fry's Smuggler's Blues. Glenn, I, uh, I got to work with several times, actually, besides Smuggler's Blues. Blues um, I uh, had an interesting experience with my kids. I was an AYSO coach in soccer, mm -hmm. and I had the kids gathered the first day, and I see Glenn Fry walking across the field. And I watched him and said, Glenn? He goes, John? I said, what are you doing here? He goes, what are you doing here? He said, I'm the coach. He goes, great, see you later. That's my kid over there. I said, wait, 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 what do you mean? You're leaving? He goes, yeah, I'm trying to write a song. I said, well, if I'm coaching your kid, don't I get 10%? He looks, he goes, no. And he walks away. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I ran into him at the Atlanta airport. And we, we had a nice little chat in the, in the airport because we're getting on the same plane. Of course, he was first class and I was uh, in cargo, basically. And the flight attendant comes walking back and says, um, uh, Mr. Glenn would like to give you this. And I look, and he had given me an Eagles uh, tour pick, you know, one of his guitar picks. Yeah. I still have to this day. And I said, tell Glenn, thanks very much. This is kind of a really cool, special thing for me. 
So she went up and you know, she came back and said, he's really excited, you're happy about that. And then, uh, then unfortunately when he died, it, I kind of took it to heart because um, it was just painful to see, you know. A great artist, a, a nice guy. Yeah, I saw I saw Joe Walsh perform not too long after after Glenn Fry died, and he did a tribute to him and did one of his songs. I thought that was pretty cool. Interesting, you bring up Joe Walsh because when I did my film No Solicitors with Eric Roberts in it, mm -hmm. the horror movie, yeah, the, one of the uh, characters, Mindy, was played by Lucy Walsh, who turned out to be Joe Walsh's daughter. Huh. small world. Very small world, and yeah. she was introduced to me through a. Uh, a friend of a mutual friend, Robbie Patton, who's a very well-known musician, and he wrote the uh, Fleetwood Mac song um, "Hold Me," which became number one seller. Great song. He said, "Hey, I have this this gal that I think would be really good for her." I said, "Yeah, okay, Robbie, go ahead," and brought her in for an audition. The minute she started talking, I said, oh, "You got the part." I just <laughs> knew right there she'd be great for it. Uh, <laughs> then you also did Sammy Hagar's "I Drive 55," another funny video. Yep, that was a, not an easy video to put together on the budget that we had, but I, th I thought it turned out really, really top-notch. Yeah, it was one of those MTV staples. Also, um, Weird Al's This Is The Life, there's like two different versions of it, with and without Johnny Dangerously clips. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, I also did the first um, Red Hot Chili Peppers video, too. And I worked with a lot. I worked with a ton. You've probably seen my website. I worked with a lot of, uh, yeah. of artists. Yeah. And um, what, what what videos did you do for Jefferson Airplane or Starship? Well, honestly, I think I did three, and I can't remember them. But Grace Slick and I had such a good time laughing with each other. She was just a gem. Yeah, she's a funny. real sweetheart, and she just uh, was really cool to be on the set with. Do you, do you remember if at least if one of them was was probably no way out with Father Guido Sarducci? Honestly, you know, I could probably look it up on my website because uh, uh, you know I've done between seven hundred and a thousand pieces of work, so it's really hard for me to remember specific title names. Okay, how did you get involved with um, Sticks for Kilroy is here, or Caught in the Act? Well, I had been working with Kramer Rockland for a while, and they called me and said, okay, we got a challenge for you. I said, shoot. So we want to do sticks, caught in the act, in Georgia, uh, but we want to shoot it with eight film cameras. Uh, how are you going to slate eight film cameras when you have a live concert? So I had to figure out how to get um, some sort of way to sync up the audio with the video. So I went to my friend... Uh, who owned the New York record plant and said, how do you guys punch in when you have a live concert? A guitar player makes a mistake. He goes, oh, we got this little reader in the truck um, that has numbers and we know exactly frame by frame where it is. Commonly called Simpty Time Code now, but back then we didn't know as filmmakers or anything what Simpty Time Code was, so it was kind of all new. So I said, are you able to put that on a monitor? He goes, if you had a distribution app, yeah. So I flew to, back to California and I went to Warner Brothers, the technical department, I told them what I wanted to do. They said, yeah, we can make an amp for you. It'll cost X amount of dollars. I said, fine, you got a deal. And then what we did is we tied that together with the audio truck and Kusta, who owned the, the plant, uh, gave me a feed out from the recording uh, uh, two inch tape that they do um, from the reader. And I had eight stations placed with monitors where the, the code would be generated so the cameraman would start on the monitor and then pan his camera up to the stage, and you have an automatic lock on picture and sound. Mm -hmm. Shot a million feet of film in 16 millimeter over three days. Wow. Yeah, was there a lot of tension uh, between the band backstage? No, the band was great. I mean, uh, Sticks, they, they were all very cool guys. Went to a lot of lunches and dinners with them, had a lot of good laughs. Uh, huh. I didn't see any tension from them at all crew worked it themselves to death because it was a tough concert. Oh, that's good. So how, how does uh, Lone Wolf come to you? Well, there was uh, a company, First Films, in, in Denver, Colorado. And remember, I used to live in Colorado, so they, they had heard of me, and I had worked in a, a theater called the Third Eye Theater. So um, the executive producer and producer of the company um, had a deal with Prism, and Prism was not uh, happy with necessarily the result so uh, they talked to me about doing Lone Wolf and I said I'm happy to do it but I, I, I think the script needs some work and they gave me permission to go ahead and work with 
the script out, uh, and so we started developing, the producers and I started developing um, more of the content of the script. And a lot of people look at that film now and say, ah, you know, it's an old kind of B-movie and the funny <laughs> hair and all that kind of stuff back in the 80s. And I said, true, but back then nobody was able to triangulate with uh, satellites and stuff where, and, you know, that it's com common practice now. You can do that with an iPhone. But we had these big chunky monitors and we created this idea of being able to track the werewolf and know where and predict where he might be on this computer. And that really wasn't kind of in the, the mix at that point. So... When I looked back at it, I thought, holy shit, we came up with something pretty cool back then that we didn't even know was going to happen. Yeah. So, <laughs> this is one like... of the funny spots with that is <laughs> one of the first days when we had the wolf on set, I said, all right, now, you see the, the, the chain link fence. I need you to run from here to there. And I hear, I can't do that. I said, what do you mean you can't do it? He says, I can't see out of the mask. So I said, what are you talking about? So I called the effects guy over, and they had forgotten to cut out the holes for his eyes so he could see. <laughs> so, you know, he would have run right into the fence. So we had to cut out the holes, and I thought the effects team did a pretty damn good job on on the wolf hit. Yeah, this is this is like right at the height of the uh, the heavy metal horror craze with like Rock and Roll Nightmare and Black Roses and Rocktober Blood. Um, were you were you a huge fan of uh, the werewolf genre? I w I'm a big fan of any film that that's made because they're so difficult to get made in the first place. Um, I really look for character and story more than anything. Mm -hmm. Genre-wise, I'm open to anything. Um, I don't like to be pigeonholed into one genre. Uh, I like the horror genre. I think it's great. Um, but I do like um, thrillers, espionage stuff, uh, comedies. You know, mm -hmm. it's, again, it comes for me. It comes back to story and yeah. character. Yeah, you you seem like you have an eclectic taste. You've been involved in so many different types of uh, filming. Well, I didn't want to get pigeonholed again. I mean, that's why I, I sort of stepped away from commercials because I had been working, I don't know, for years, at 365 days a, a year for years, and I said, no, I can't do this anymore because I'm getting pigeonholed as a commercial guy, and I don't want to do that. So, um, you know, it went from there into doing live-action trailers and all sorts of stuff, including... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, being the guy whose company I, I produced and co-directed the TriStar logo with the horse coming out of the clouds, so it was uh, that was a phenomenal piece of work. Mm -hmm. How many days did it take to film? Well, it, it's it took us about a year to put the whole project together. Filming wise, uh, again, you know, it's hard to remember all these things, but um, we had to build all the clouds on a on a set because everything was live action. Just digital was just starting to happen so the only element in that entire logo that was digital were the feathers on the horse mm -hmm. um, otherwise everything else in there we had shot live in, in uh, either it was uh, 35 millimeter uh, or 70 millimeter um, so it was quite a, a task to put together yeah what, what made you shoot in Colorado of all places you mean for Lone Wolf yeah well that's where the base of the company was uh, and they wanted to keep it there. Are you are you in touch with anyone in the cast still? Yeah, a couple of people have reached out to me on Facebook, um, and you know, just said, "Hey, I was in your film," and hey, that's really cool. How you doing? And you know, yeah, back and forth. You know, every every film or any project I've ever been on, the cast and crew and I have always gotten along really well. And you know, if we run into each other, it's really cool. Like Susie, uh, Susie who was in my no solicitors was also in Wes Craven's film, so we had a good giggle when we ran into each other. Said, "No shit, really?" She goes, "Yeah, this could be a lot of fun." And so, you know, it's uh, it's always good to keep a relationship like that alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the heart ripping scene in the alley is gold. I <laughs> love that that <laughs> that killed the most of all of them. <laughs> yes, that was gross. <laughs> was it more gross in in person? <laughs> No, because, I mean, obviously we knew what the effect was, but, you know, the end result I thought was really cool. Mm-hmm. Did you, did you guys have, a, like, a rap party and a cast screening? We did. We had a rap party, uh, a cast screening with, well, it was more than a cast screening. It, it was um, uh, the executive producer invited a lot of people, probably a couple hundred people there watching it. And, you know, I just kind of sat in between the crowd. I didn't want anyone to, you know, say, oh, this director, and blah, blah, blah. And I kept hearing people going, hey, this is really cool, this is good. And, and I, you know, kind of put a smile on my face, you know. It's, 
we all work pretty hard in some pretty bad conditions and to hear people enjoying the film made me really happy mm -hmm. how did you uh, get to be a producer on Bobby's World well that's another one of those things where I got a call from a friend saying uh, the company needs you to go over there and talk to them they may have made a mistake I said okay so I went over and I sat down with with the uh, team and I said um, what's the problem they said, um, we may have screwed up. I said, how? They said, I think we shot in the wrong order. We shot the live action, and now we want to marry the, uh, the uh, animation to it. So I had to create a, a little cell that had um, fields in it to know exactly where the actor was looking, Howie Mandel. Mm -hmm. And I stuck it in the camera, and we were able to guide it, and I had to put points on the stage where he was. And then after that, you know, when they hired me to do the next uh, group of, of uh, episodes, we married the two elements together as we went. So I had a green screen and I had, because they didn't shoot in front of a green screen. So I had it, it was pretty complicated to get that to match. And when they got into the lab and they married it, they called me and said, this matched perfectly. We want you to do uh, some more episodes for us. And it turned out I wound up doing 80 episodes and I got an Emmy nomination for it, which was really cool. Nice. Um, yeah, so we, we went the other route. We did... Um, the green screen with Howie in front of the green screen and we would put little points where Bobby was going to be so that his eye line would match perfectly and yeah, you know, it just went along really seamlessly. Oh, was it like a rotoscope thing? Well, no, by then it was really more of a um, digital composition than rotoscoping. I see. You still talk to Howie? No, I haven't talked to him in many, many years. Okay. Uh, he's gone off to do some pretty amazing things. He was a cool guy to work with. I mean, we had a lot of fun, you know. Yeah. I know a lot of people say he was a germaphobe and all this, but he put his <laughs> arm around us, took pictures with the kids and I, and, um, yeah, no, he was fine with us. Yeah. That's cool. I mean, look, my son is a germaphobe now, so I understand, yeah. <laughs> I understand that kind of stuff. Um, but, nah, Howie was great to work with. That's good. That's good. Now, you mentioned uh, no, no solicitors. Um, what's the genesis behind that? Well, I have a sign outside my door that says no solicitors. Yeah. And every time somebody would ring the doorbell, I'd get really annoyed because, you know, uh, do you not read English? No solicitors means don't ring the frickin' bell. And so I was having lunch with my friend at Warner Brothers, and uh, I told him that I was really frustrated, and mm -hmm. I chased a couple of realtors off my property with a baseball bat because uh, I was so pissed at them because they kept being annoying. And, uh, and and he said, well, why don't you write a horror movie about it? I said, that's a great idea. And then I started thinking about the horror genre, and I said, you know, I want to do something a little different. I don't want the typical, you know, an axe guy chasing, you know, bare-breasted chicks running around the woods and chopping them up. I said, there's got to be something more. So I tried to go through every possible cliche I could think of before I started writing uh, the uh, film. And I came up with this idea, what if it was a Norman Rockwell family, that everything was normal? It wasn't horrific. It wasn't set in the woods. It was like in a suburban town. And it turned out that this guy was like a brain surgeon. His wife was running the hospital, and the kids were running the back office, which turned out to be the, if, if a solicitor came to the house uninvited, they would drag him downstairs to the basement and drug him. And I'm not going to tell you the whole thing because I don't mm -hmm. want to ruin it for the audiences, but yeah. it turned out that they turned out to be cannibals. <laughs> so, so I got my revenge on a lot of realtors <laughs> interesting is the doorbell hasn't been ringing at all since that film came out oh, <laughs> that's a good thing then <laughs> it's a great thing <laughs> but some of my friends don't come over for ribs either which if you see the movie you'll understand what I mean by that <laughs> how's working with Eric Roberts one of the more fun experiences I've had this guy um treated the crew with a lot of respect. Uh, you know, I, I'll be honest with you, when, when we hired him, I thought, okay, here's, here's like one of the king of all time. I mean, I loved his work in Runaway Train and, you know, all these other great films. I thought, how do you direct a guy like this? And then I had to have a little talk to myself saying, look, he's an actor, you're a director. He wants to do the best job possible to make the film as special as, as I could possibly get it. So the first day on set, somebody came in and said, Eric, I'd like to meet you. And I went over to his dressing room, and he was having this, you know, like fruit breakfast, and he said, would you like some food? I said, thanks, Eric, I just had breakfast, and we sat and talked about the film. And he was very open about it. He said, you know, tell me what you want, and blah, blah, blah. I said, well, 
you know, I don't like to cramp actors. I'd like to see what you want to bring to this, and, and we can go from there. And he liked that idea. You know, I wasn't trying to be a hot shot director or anything. I just wanted him to do his best. And, you know, he, I'm sure he, once he got into the part, he understood what I was after. And, you know, a couple of times during, during the filming, he would ask me some questions, and I'd give him, you know, direction on it. Mm -hmm. And he would also have some playful moments, you know, the clapper that marks the scene with the sound and picture. He'd stick his finger in so the guy couldn't clap it, and it would all laugh. And you know, he just made everyone very comfortable. Yeah. Um, had a lot of really wonderful conversations with the guy. Very bright man. You know, it's uh, yeah. some of the things that came out of his mouth while we were talking. I went, "Holy crap! That's that's really a good perspective." So it, it was really a, a good thing to work with uh, with him. Yeah, I, I interviewed his wife, and then I went to. Um, convention met them both they were both so cool that i asked um, his wife to come back on and she brought him with her and i did not expect that and i was nervous i'm like asking her all the prepared questions i had for her and i'm going on imdb at the same time to come up with questions for him i was just so friggin' nervous but it, it, it turned out okay it was it was decent you know yeah well rob eric and eliza are just a wonderful couple yeah um they don't come in with an attitude. They, you know, they're they're people. Yeah. And they treat other people like people, and you got to respect a human like that. Exactly. Yes. I, I I cherish the fact that I know I know both of them now. It's yeah. it's very gratifying. I have to yep. say. Now you've 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 cut a lot of movie trailers for very popular movies for from The Blob to A Few Good Men, The Golden Child, Dennis the Menace, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. I mean. It, it's it's my belief that it it takes a skill to not just make a great trailer, but also make a great trailer that's going to turn the movie into a box office hit. I agree. Um, I yeah. didn't cut those things. I was responsible for shooting all the live action elements. Um, the company okay. Interlink Film Graphic Design, who was hired by the studios, did all the editorial and concept and all that kind of stuff. Oh, okay. It was my company that came in to, to make the production happen. Oh, okay, sorry about that. <laughs> oh, no, I just want to be clear about it, you know, for your audience, because, you know, I, mean, I do have a background in, in advertising and marketing, because I've worked in the commercial field, so I have a good eye for all that, but that wasn't my responsibility. Mine was to produce the film uh, elements and get them to the editors so that they could go and do their work. Mm -hmm. You even did um, Date with an Angel for Tommy McLaughlin. Yeah, I've interviewed him. He's a good guy. Never met him, but I'm sure he is. Yeah. So do, do you have any uh, upcoming projects? I mean, is anything shelved in, in quarantine for you? Uh, yeah, there's a film out of Australia. Um, uh, Linda uh, Marie Curry wrote and wants me to direct, and um, it's called The Witch's Night. Um, so she's busy raising the money for that right now. It's a really wonderful tale that she's come up with. Mm -hmm. um, I'm working with a woman, um, Erica Scott, out of Buffalo on a, a web series that um, I think is going to be a pretty good hit. And um, I have a show that I, I wrote a novel that, and then turned it into screenplay. We have an investor package and a shooting schedule and the budget and all that called Christmas Voices which is a blend between A Christmas Carol and It's a Wonderful Life, like a <laughs> modern-day Scrooge. Nice. Um, and then I'm writing my fifth novel called uh, The Myth. So I'm staying pretty busy doing this whole pandemic stuff, but it, a lot of it's development. You know, it's not putting coin in my pocket at the moment. But that's the, the life of a filmmaker. Yeah. Well, that's cool that you got all that going on. I hope it all comes to full wish in once you know everything gets back to normal hope so hopefully from your lips to god's ears yeah <laughs> well john thank you so much uh for taking the time today and stay safe because we need filmmakers out there in this world well i appreciate it and i'm very honored to have been on your show and uh thanks for reaching out it's been a lot of fun and if uh you ever need any follow-up let me know i'd be happy to get back on the line with you absolutely sir you have yourself a great day you too be well and be safe i will okay bye bye well there you have it john callis ain't he a cool dude nice guy great stories there very eclectic in filmmaking that's what i love people who are eclectic 
Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes!